The British pound sterling is generally worth somewhere between a dollar twenty of the US currency and a dollar thirty, depending on the exchange rate, the phase of the moon, and the turning of the seasons. There's not a lot that can be bought from the world of tech for just one of these shiny disks of mutually established monetary worth, so with that in mind, here is my review of… well, not a whole lot. The i3-4160's not the only Haswell dual-core I've tested on my channel. A few months back I tested the Pentium G3258, a CPU which can obtain some still impressively high clock speeds, but despite this apparent advantage, its modern day performance was far less impressive. The i3-4160 is built on the same architecture, has the same number of cores, but it has one thing the Pentium doesn't have. A great big bushy beard! <clears throat> Actually, despite significantly lower clock speeds and locked multipliers, the Haswell i3s have two distinct advantages over the G3258, the first being hyperthreading, the ability for the CPU's built-in scheduler to perform two instructions per cycle, creating effectively a second logical core per physical one. While a hyperthread is generally less performant than a physical core, and not every application takes advantage of them, a dual core needs all the help it can get in a DX12 world. The second advantage, and one I've been evangelical about when comparing Haswell against its predecessors, is AVX2 instructions. Some games flat out refuse to start without this particular instruction set, and I believe that AVX2 is responsible for some of the larger differences between otherwise similar CPUs of different generations, so I expect far more playable results than I got from either the G3258 or the older, even cheaper i3-2100. Now, about that price, I picked up the i3-4160 for £2.95 delivered, of which £1.95 was the postage cost. If you're in the UK, you probably have a sex franchise somewhere near you, and if it's within walking distance, you too could hypothetically pick up a Haswell i3 like this one, or maybe even a better one, for one or two quid. Given the abundance of 2014 vintage office pre-builts on the used market, this shouldn't be a huge surprise, especially as anyone using an Optiplex from this era could easily upgrade to an i5 for less than the cost of a takeaway. To find out whether or not the dual core is worth the extremely low price, I'm testing it using a Overkill Z97 motherboard with 16GB of DDR3-2400 and a GB RTX 3070. While my Pentium experience in Valorant was something of a waking nightmare, the i3 is surprisingly tolerable. Not a great time to be honest, and the latency didn't help my already below average sniping skills, but a 140fps average and 70fps 1% low should provide some entertainment while you wait for your i5-4570 to arrive. Battlefield 5 was literally unplayable on the G3258, whereas on the 4160 it's merely figuratively unplayable. The average across three matches came to about 55 FPS, though smoke, aiming down sights and heavy particle effects could frequently see frame rates drop into the low double digits. The overclocked i5-4690K did quite a lot better in this title, so I'd imagine even a cheap i5 could give you a better time. Along comes Fortnite to save the day. Cash-strapped Optiplex owners can expect to pull somewhere in the region of 130 FPS on average in performance mode. You won't even need a particularly powerful GPU to do it. My RTX 3070 is only being taxed by about 30 to 40% most of the time, so a GTX 1650 or RX 6400 should perform about the same.
It's possible that I've overstated the mess that is using low-spec CPUs in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Most of the four thread chips I've ever tested cause LODs to drop very low, and in fairness, the i3 does a lot better in this regard than the Pentium did. It's most egregious in big, landmark-strewn destinations like Manhattan, and someone who's flying for the sake of flying rather than treating it as a vacation simulator could probably tolerate it. They might have more trouble putting up with the 31 FPS average and 21 FPS 1% lows though. Given that Marvel's Spider-Man was originally built around the solar-powered calculator CPU of the PS4, this should be an embarrassing result for the i3. Even without RT, it's not capable of even close to the magic 50fps or the 60fps so many of you sheeple have been brainwashed to believe in. At 45fps, swinging through the city isn't intolerable, but the cinematic 1% lows don't lend themselves to fun gameplay. Adding RT is inadvisable, as averages are cut almost in half to 23 FPS. Trying to play Cyberpunk on the i3 is not a good idea. My ultra run at DLSS quality results in an average FPS of 25, and for those of you thinking lower settings would help, I'm afraid not. Dropping to medium with DLSS balance gains a negligible 0.8 FPS average and equally low gains to the 1% and 0.1%. Once more, RT is painful to behold, dropping below 20 FPS. Red Dead Redemption 2, thankfully, saves the day with a smooth, fluid frame rate that is genuinely surprising. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry, that's not true at all. I lied to you, this isn't a good time. 27 FPS on average and 17 FPS 1% lows are about half what you'd expect from an overclocked 4th Gen i5, and even a locked i7 from two generations earlier can manage to break 60 FPS. So RDR fans should consider something a bit less frugal than a £1 and I3. While your DX11 experience will probably be a smoother one in The Witcher 3, DX12 is more CPU intensive and is the API I've tested all my other processors with. Again, I hate to bring up the G3258, but considering that crappy old CPU could only display about a frame per minute in this title, even with an overclock, the 4160's 26 frames per second is actually a huge upgrade. Civ 6 gave a few indicators it might crash rather than load the benchmark, and I heard a lot more of Sean Bean's monologue than I'm used to hearing, but in the end it did complete the AI turn time benchmark for an average of 9.19 seconds. Again, slightly ahead of the G3258 and way ahead of the second gen i3, but even a cheap i5 could shave hours or even days of waiting off your world domination experience. And that just about sums it up. The i3-4160 occupies the second spot from the bottom on the leaderboard of CPUs I've tested so far, beating the i3-2100 and the overclocked Pentium G3258, but losing to just about everything else. If you picked up a used Optiplex and found one of these lurking in the socket, you could maybe turn it loose on some basic emulators, maybe a vintage game here and there, but modern DX12 titles would benefit from even a cheap upgrade. 
If you're interested to see how far a 4th gen Intel system can go in 2023 gaming, check out the Potato to Powerhouse video linked on screen now. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.